Sam, that was absolutely inspirational. Where are you? Okay, it was truly inspirational, and it forced me. I was planning not to actually uh, frame uh, the next discussion, but some of the things you said I think are so important that they need, and they can help us maybe transition to the next session. So with your indulgence, um, I'm a great believer in non-experts and uh, very suspicious of expertise and professionalism. Uh, and we've been using one word at this conference quite a lot, entrepreneurs uh, and entrepreneurship and new ideas. There's another French word which is very rarely used, but it's actually my mantra. It's, uh, the word is bricolage. Um, and it's, it's got a very bad press uh, because many people think that means you're being a dilettante or an amateur. What it really is, is somebody who can fix a fridge one day, fix a car the next, uses the same tools, but has to be a very acute observer of what's on the ground because the responses actually are not coming necessarily from the person. They're to do with what you have at your disposal at any one time. So you're not uh, handicapped by not having a blueprint. And uh, what you've just shown us is an example of somebody who is not handicapped by not having a blueprint and listening carefully and letting, uh, as you said, uh, the client, the person you're trying to help, be in the driver's seat. It's absolutely essential. It's such a simple uh, but absolutely fundamental. It's a game changer. So I really thank you for that presentation. I'm very touched by it. Um, I won't go on. My job is to be the traffic cop. And uh, m the traffic cop usually just does this, that, and the other. Um, and we're, we are running late. Um, so what we're going to do is have Jennifer, who's the program officer of the MacArthur Foundation, and then Chris Lawrence, the director of the Hive Learning Center uh, in New York City, and then Isabel Jonet, the president of the European Federation of Food Banks, present all together. Each of them will take 10 minutes and uh, after 30 minutes, we'll open the floor to questions. And with no further ado, I want to start. Jennifer, would you like to, to go? Just sit down, yeah, if, unless you want to come up here. I know a lot about technology, you can tell. <laughs> um, so thank you, Jerry, and uh, a special thank you to the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation for inviting me. It's been a real privilege to be here these last couple days, and it, it really is such a beautiful country, so I've really been enjoying myself. Um, so as Jerry said, I'm a program officer with the MacArthur Foundation. It's an international foundation based in Chicago, um, but we do have offices in India, Mexico, Nigeria, and Russia. We make grants totaling about $220 million every year on a range of issues. Internationally, those include human rights, conservation, women's reproductive health, um, global security, and at the domestic level, uh, they range from affordable housing, community development, education, juvenile justice reform. And as you can see from the screenshot of our homepage, we also do, do some, uh, provide support for arts, arts and culture in Chicago, specifically. I work on the domestic side of the foundation for a program called Digital Media and Learning, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the topic of the panel today is do you invest for the long term or do you help people on the ground right now? And I would argue that you can do both. And this slide here, what you're looking at, is that's, that's actually some American candy, and it's really chewy. <laughs> it's called now and later because I think you can put it in your mouth and you're chewing it now. And, you keep on chewing it, so you're also chewing it later. And um, anyway, I sort of used it because I thought it would be a nice way for you to remember my, uh, the, my, the topic of my presentation. Um, but I'm going to tell you the story of the Digital Media and Learning Program because I think there are a lot of lessons to be drawn um, that apply to the topic of this conference. 
Um, so as a background, just so you know what I'm talking about, um, the Digital Media and Learning Program is an extension of our Education Reform Grant Making Program. Um, and this program focuses mostly on kids in high school, which is about the age of 14 to 18. Um, and in the United States, kids from starting at about the age 4 through 18 get a free education through our public education system. Um, and there are some very good schools. Um, actually, the picture up here is of a school in Chicago, uh, a high school called Lincoln Park High, and it's actually a pretty good high school. Um, but I think overall, most people in the United States would agree with me that our education uh, is in crisis. About 30% of kids drop out of high school nationally. That's the national rate. And in urban areas like Chicago and New York, um, it's sometimes above 50%. And many of the kids who do graduate from school don't have the skills to compete in the global economy. And frankly, they don't really even have the skills uh, to participate fully in America's democracy. And it's something that concerns us and concerns a lot of people. So um, back to MacArthur. As I was saying, MacArthur, uh, the Digital Media and Learning Program is an extension of our education reform program. Um, and we've been making grants um, in traditional education reform since the late 1980s. In the first eight or nine years, we invested about $40 million just to improve the public school system in Chicago. And we really felt like we did not move the needle much at all for many reasons that I'm sure many of you can relate to. It's a huge bureaucracy. There are many moving pieces. Um, and we decided, okay, maybe let's move on to a national initiative and see if we can do some work at the national level. We launched a $40 million initiative that was working in three large urban districts in different places in the United States. Um, and within the two years that the initiative was up and running, we'd cycled through 11 different district leaders. And at that point, we decided, OK, this just isn't going to work. Um, and we took a big step back. We took a step back from schools, and we took a step back from, from uh, districts. And we thought, OK, let's focus on the learner. And let's think about how kids learn with digital media. We'd seen that the internet and digital media had really transformed many industries, but education looked a lot the same as it did 100 years ago. And we asked ourselves why. Um, and so we did a little investigating to see if we were maybe on to something, to see if maybe this could be a new route for our education grant making. Um, and we, we convened some experts, we funded a little bit of research, and we came to sort of two big conclusions that led us to believe, okay, yes, we are on to something and this is a good direction to be going in. Um, the first one is that digital media are fueling new ways of creating, organizing, sharing information and knowledge. And the narrative in the United States, I don't know what it's like here, is sort of a negative one. It's that digital media and the internet is a distraction for kids, that it's isolating them, that it's making them fat, you know, all these really negative uh, narratives. When in fact, our findings showed quite the opposite that there were some very robust learning opportunities online and that kids were collaborating online um, and doing many of the same things that they do um, in the real world. Uh, the second big conclusion that we came to was that the internet and social media and the networks that they support, and I think that's the important part, um, could lead to new ways of thinking about learning beyond the classroom, that they could connect and help value the learning that happens in every place in a young person's life, whether it's in school, in libraries, in museums, in online communities. And that maybe we should start thinking about learning as anytime, anywhere. So with those two big insights, we launched the Digital Media and Learning Initiative in earnest in 2006. And since then, we've funded about $100 million in grants in support of it. Um, we began by funding research to better understand how kids learn with digital media and to really build a base of evidence from which we could make some good decisions. And at the same time we were doing that, we were also funding some design experiments to help us vi envision what a 21st century learning environment could look like. And it was really important that both of those uh, activities were happening at the same time. The research helped inform what would happen with the design experiments, and what we learned with the design experiments fed back into our research agenda. Um, so the first five to six years uh, is a phase that, 
from about 2006 to 2010, 2011, we really thought about it as our exploration period. Um, and, uh, and I should mention that when I talk about we, as I move forward, I'm really talking about MacArthur and our grantees. The initiative was very much co-created with the grantees. It, uh, MacArthur was really wanting to help create a new field that didn't exist. There were a lot of researchers and practitioners that were interested in these uh, ideas and these issues, but they didn't work together within a single field. Um, and so one of our early goals was to help coalesce a field, a group of people who knew each other, knew how to contact each other and work together um, in this new field called digital media and learning. Um, and there were a few things that we observed in these first five to six years about what a reimagined uh, learning uh, system might look like for the 21st century. And I'm going to summarize there, of course, I've only got 10 minutes, so there's a lot more nuance than this. But the first is that kids learn best when they are interested in things. And I think that's no surprise. I learn best when I'm interested in something. But it was a really important principle for us to remember as we thought about how we'd reimagine learning in the 21st century. The second is that interests are not inherent. We're, of course, not born with them. And that most young people develop interests through their peer networks, from their friends, from their siblings, sometimes from their parents and other adults who introduce them to, to new ideas and concepts. Um, and so it's something that needs to be nurtured. It's not something that we can just expect to have happen. Um, and the third is that many of the things uh, kids do online have value or relevance in school. They're, they're reading and they're writing and they're collaborating and they're generating ideas. Um, and so it's many of the things that they do in school plus more. Um, and so what really emerged for us was a framework for thinking about learning in a different way. And this is how we tend to present it. I don't know if it's actually the, the best way to present it. But it's uh, at the intersection of the three parts of a young person's life that matter the most to them. The things that they're interested in, their peer networks, their friends, and then how they do in school. And when those three come together, we feel that's when the best learning can happen. Um, and so this framework um, begins with kids, kids' interests, helps to connect formal and informal learning spaces, um, helping us to define learning much more broadly than what those activities that happen in the classroom. Um, and one uh, whose goal was really to make visible and value the learning that takes place everywhere in a kid's life. So, of course, you earn grades and diplomas in school, but there's all this robust learning that happens outside of school. And how do we make sure young people get credit for that? Um, so, as I said, we're calling this framework connected learning. And the idea is that it's not a model, but it's a set of design principles and ideas and practices that can be taken by anyone, remixed and adapted to fit any context or any community. Um, and I think that, that was really important to us. We think that the best way of spreading ideas is to give people the building blocks and for them uh, to um, take them and do what they need for their communities from there. Um, I mentioned earlier that as we were funding research and as this framework was emerging, um, we were also funding demonstration sites. And we were, we were doing this um, to learn, but also to demonstrate to people what was possible and to uh, inspire them to start thinking about learning in a different way. And I can't express enough how important this part was um, because these demonstration sites have really been the inspiration behind much of the momentum of the initiative going forward. Um, and I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about some of these uh, demonstration sites. And this, this first one is probably going to look a little familiar if any of you were here for uh, the, I have a minute left, um, for the presentation yesterday afternoon about the library in northern Greece. This is a, lot, a teen learning space in the main public library in downtown Chicago. It's called UMedia. Um, the idea with UMedia is that there's space where kids can hang out, there's space when they could tinker around, play with new ideas, and space where they can dive deep uh, into things that they learn about. And here, we call it hanging out, messing around, Oops. And geeking out. <laughs> um, another demonstration site, which is what Chris is going to talk about today, is the Hive Learning Network. 
There's a Hive Learning Network in Chicago, and there's one in New York, and the Hive Learning Network really was an effort to help create the distributed network of, of people and institutions around the city that provide learning for the kids. So it's not just schools, but museums and libraries and online communities and whatnot. Um, MacArthur's also funded a school, one in New York and one in Chicago, to help us reimagine what the school day might look like. Um, and at the school, the school's based on the principles of game design, and what that means is that game designers partner with educators to design the curriculum. Um, and the curriculum is challenge-based, much like uh, a game, in that kids take on the behaviors and the personas of uh, you know, explorers and scientists and mathematicians, um, and they work through the curriculum as a set of challenges. And much like a game, in order to reach the next level, you have to master the content in front of you. So um, that too has been a model that uh, has gathered, has um, been successful and a lot of people are, are interested in it. And I guess that's it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jack, am I on? I like to push this. Uh, here we go. Um, Kalimara, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here today and address you all, and hopefully um, what we can talk about will spark some good conversation. I'm hitting my timer. Um, okay, as Jen introduced, my name is Chris, and i um, from the Hive Learning Network in New York City, and we are actually a product of MacArthur's digital media and learning work, um, and we are a project um, and stewarded by uh, the Mozilla Foundation. Um, and so some other projects, before I dive deeper into Hive, that Mozilla is involved with um, can be seen here. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Firefox. Um, it's important to mention Firefox because it was the product of a non-profit organization um, that essentially revolutionized the world and how we think about browsers and reestablishing um, open and uh, standards-based systems on the web, which was um, a victory of ginormous proportions. Um, Mozilla has also, in the last couple of years, dedicated ourselves to learning and learning in digital context um, with our WebMaker brand, which the Hive Learning Network um, work falls under. And the idea is to get people to think about how you build and make and create on the web. Um, I work with teens and, and youth, and we are also looking at filmmakers, game designers, and journalists. So, Quickly, I will kind of walk us through the two core sort of philosophies of both MacArthur and Mozilla that Hive operates under, um, with, and they're both very highly aligned, but with Mozilla, um, this statement right here, how do we get people from consuming to creating? So, uh, especially but not limited to the web, um, you know, we have this idea of elegant consumption. Um, you know, products like Apple and other services that make it so easy, uh, elegant, and wonderful to consume that we forgot about the power of, of being a producer, even if the results are uglier um, and harder to manage, there's still the power in production. And then, of course, as Jen talked about, connected learning guiding principles, which is really um, a set of learning principles that our work is guided in as a pedagogy in how we do our work. And so you can see here, um, it starts to tease out a little bit about what Jen introduced you to in terms of what some of those guiding principles are. So, as I've said, I'm from the Hive Learning Network in New York City. Um, basically, an attempt um, to bring together cultural institutions, museums, libraries, youth development um, organizations, after-school clubs of all kinds to come together and think of themselves as a distributed network, um, as collaborators, and that in a networked approach would be a much more successful way to leverage their expertise and resources to solving um, a city or large urban centers um, educational needs, their learning needs, in and out of school. Um, and so there's a, some more detail there. Um, here's a, a map of the five boroughs of New York City. You can see um, the points represent different organizations within the Hive Learning Network, spread out all over um, all five of the boroughs, um, obviously concentrated in Manhattan, as most of New York City is to a degree, um, but distributed all throughout uh, the city as well, and to the outreaches of, of the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and even Staten Island. 
Um, so kind of connecting with the idea of recollage, um, one of the things that I think is actually interesting about our work is that it forces people to wear many helmets. Um, and so as you can see, there are many collaborators within this work, even on the top level, and that a person like myself or the director in Chicago has to be able to work in many fields and understand many different pieces of, of, of how that works. So MacArthur Foundation and their digital media learning portfolio works. It's at the top. Mozilla Foundation um, as our steward um, and collaborator. And then we also work in New York City with the New York Community Trust, whose task is to help us um, raise funds for our projects and create a system that distributes funds throughout the network to do projects. And I'm sort of in the nexus of all of those different aspects. So at times I have to be a programming person and an educator. I have to be a, a grant maker and someone who, who funnels resources. I have to be a peer counselor. Um, I have to be a, an advisor. Um, and I have to be able to switch those helmets um, very f fluid in which to work within this network. So I'm going to make one statement here that I think is important that a lot of our work um, and what I think is important for foundations, for philanthropy, um, for government, um, for individuals is this idea that we should be spending our time building networks rather than building or rehabilitating communities. Um, and that that is the kind of approach that's going to have the kind of spread and scale that might be able to so help solve and address um, the gargantuan problems that we we see in Greece, Europe, globally, and in the United States as well. So I'm very inspired by the work of a North American sociologist named Barry Wellman, um, who has started to put some of these ideas together and, and what he calls um, networked individualism. Um, and this idea that rather than considering ourselves and the reality of, of uh, people's lives is that we are less members of a community and beholden to one community, but more um, highly networked individuals who become more sophisticated about how they move through networks, how they leverage networks, and then in, be uh, brought into interaction with many different communities and networks and individuals. And I really take this approach in our work, but I also apply that not only to individuals, as, uh, but also to um, the foundations, the organizations and institutions that we work with, the educators, and lastly, but most importantly, the youth. And so I really like to apply this lens of networked individualism to all aspects and institutions and people that we work with within our networked approach. Um, I also think that it's been really interesting this morning, um, both listening to Sam um, and his work and what I think is going to be talked about on this panel, that this sort of networked approach is, is possibly a theme of, of this morning's program, uh, intentionally or otherwise. Um, so here's kind of a graphic that, that starts to walk through how we work in New York City as a network, whether it's institutions, youth, educators, or foundations, or funders, um, moving away from the one-to-one -one model even moving away a little bit from the community model and into the highly complex, cross-purposed, multi-connection networked approach. Um, I'm going to give you quickly some guiding principles that really, um, outside of the networked approach, that also guide our work. Um, this one um, is really what I remind myself about every hour, is less yak, more hack. Um, and basically what that means is that the time for talking is over and the time, it's really a time for action, and that, the, the, that we should really be managing the amount of conversations we have and r building things, making things, establishing new norms, and putting ideas into practice. And so this comes from the Mozilla culture, um, and this is really the sort of the, the saying that we, that we really like to put out into the world. And so hack, it really is making or building or creating. So let's stop talking and, and start building. So the other thing that really guides our work is looking at entrepreneurship um, and um, companies and the design process so that we can more quickly put innovations into the education marketplace or, or any marketplace um, and take this kind of dirty prototyping, quick iteration um, philosophy into models of ed reform or reimagining learning or however you want to frame that, but that we really need to push things in, have them prototyped quickly, 
and learn from what's working and not working and be in an iterative cycle. Um, sort of, uh, you know, release early and release often, maybe as a, drawing from the software world. So that really means embracing failure um, and understanding that there's a lot to be learned and what doesn't work. And if you're moving through a fast process, then the failure doesn't have to have that large an impact because you're quickly remixing and iterating at a fast pace so you can quickly learn from mistakes, triage and move forward. Although I know this is, this is not an easy um, concept to embrace. Um, the third organizing principle for us really is that all of this work has to be done in an open ecosystem. And so for funders, for institutions, the letting go of, of proprietary nature of, of funds, of resources, of audience, um, of participants is, is a relatively radical approach, but one that we're very deeply connected to, to um, sewing and the work that we do in MacArthur DML and the Mozilla work and specifically in Hive. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this. Um, one of the reasons that I've been here this week is to really think about directly how foundations and this work from a programmatic standpoint can be a intervention into Athens, um, and especially when it comes to our youth and to education and learning. Um, and so we're thinking about building this. And in fact, we, we had a lot less yak this week and a lot more hack and hopefully have some exciting plans over the next couple months towards actually building out pieces of this and thinking about what we've learned in New York and Chicago and other places might be um, fairly quickly leveraged here in a local community. Um, Yazoo, yeah, and thank you, and I look forward to a robust conversation. So, uh now it's my turn. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation of, of uh, Stavos Nayarkos Foundation to be here and just sharing with you some of uh, the projects we have been uh, making in Portugal in this exact way of working together. And uh, both the first uh, exposition and now uh, also these two interventions focus exactly on this working together, and I think that if we can work together, so uh, life will be better and uh, all, the, uh, all the efforts of grants and philanthropy will uh, create more social value. So what I'm briefly exposing you is what we have done in the last, uh, in the last 80 years in Portugal. Uh, just to characterize, and numbers are important, <clears throat> Portugal is one of the European countries with higher level of poverty, and almost now, almost 20% of people um, are poor people. And so, you just cannot think that we are going to change anything if you don't work together with, with these people. But the social sector represents almost 4% of uh, the gross value added and uh, almost 4% of the employment. And it's higher than several industries. So we must help this social sector to be more efficient. In Portugal, the uh, charities, the associations are almost all uh, have born from Catholic uh, Church because it's culturally like that, as in Spain, as in Italy, and uh, as in France, and as in other uh, countries. Uh, but these uh, associations now live with uh, lots of uh, difficulties because they are n no, not so much uh, 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 religions that uh, can help volunteer you working. So, um, more than uh, more, 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 more important is that these associations can be the biggest co cohesion instruments, and they can help reducing all the social tensions and. Uh, even uh, European Commission considers these associations as so mo 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 more important than we must focus on working together with them. So 
uh, we created Entrejuda in uh, 204, and uh, what we wanted is to uh, help these associations to be more efficient, because if they were more efficient, they could optimize resources that are scarce, and they would have a better impact on poverty and social ex in exclusion. And so they could contribute to a more sustainable future and social cohesion. And what we have done, and uh, this is the, the reason why I'm, I'm here in this uh, panel, is that we are sure that we can uh, help with education in, in uh, non-profits and capacity building. We can, with the help of philanthropy, uh, we can help uh, f uh, the future of poor people. So what we do is to uh, is to mobilize uh, volunteer people that have qualifications and also people that want to help with grants, with uh, donations, uh, but with uh, qualified donations. So we had built a bridge between those who wish to re give and those who need to receive just creating social value because uh, we think we can um, get to these associations exactly what they are needing. So just to, uh, just to uh, uh, make a position, Ptente uh, Ajuda was born from the knowledge that we have of associations by the food banks. And uh, they are now uh, 19 food banks, almost 20, next week 20, uh, food banks in Portugal. And uh, what we know is that those food banks give food to associations, never to people in need, but those food banks in Portugal help feeding 3% of Portuguese population. So that these food banks know almost half of the charities in activity for 20 years now, and they have built a network of trust with these associations. So when we created Entrejuda, what we were, we were proposing is working together with these associations, but giving them capacity building with people that could know. And now what we had last year, it was 3,300 uh, three, uh, three, uh, organizations that were registered in Entrejuda asking us for help in capacity building. building. So we are not now covering all Portugal with some project of uh, helping these, uh, these uh, charities. What we do is several, we propose several interventions. The core, the core business of Entrejuda is management and consultancy to the third sector by volunteer professionals that want to, to give and to share what exactly they know. Informat informaticians or uh, 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 lawyers or uh, anything. We work a lot with universities and we propose trainings in charities to uh, several universities. And so we do lots of training because if you don't teach people to know different, to, 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 to work different, they w will not know. Because lots of programs that have been proposed, and I liked very much your image, that was the money that was thrown away by the window, uh, failed because people are afraid of changing, because they are afraid of not being able to do uh, things differently. So we are proposing training sections uh, uh, where people are put are put together, and we are we are uh, doing this, this very practical with uh, uh, subjects that are interesting all these uh, charities. And then we launch a platform of volunteer network 
and uh, I must tell you it was so successful that last year it was the project that was chosen by the European Commission uh, as the best project in Portugal uh, for the European Year of Volunteer. And we created this volunteer book. We have just registered that name also. And volunteer book is exactly putting together experience sharing best practice in a third sector. And now we have lots of uh, charities that are in volunteer book, but we have also lots of people that want to be volunteer and know, don't know uh, uh, how to do it. I'm, going, I'm telling you that uh, I'm going to Cabo Verde in Africa in two weeks, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm trying to uh, begin this in Africa, sharing volunteer needs and sharing volunteer um, uh, want volunteer capacity and also profiting what corporates uh, can help in this uh, volunteer world. So we also created within Entrejuda a non-food bank, equ equipments and good banks. And what you, we distribute is Everything that enterprises, corporate, just don't need anymore, but that can be very useful to, uh, to uh, the third uh, sector. Because um, big enterprises, uh, and I'm sure that uh, all uh, of you know this better than I do, maybe, have got leasing contracts or uh, other type of contracts with, for this uh, informatic equipment. And they reject, uh, after two or three years, uh, good equipment that are still very good in good conditions to charities, and that can be used, with, with, and that can be used and reducing environmental impacts. So what we do is to prolong the life of all these equipment, uh, and we are talking about. Uh, everything that you can imagine. So we also propose a corporate volunteer project, uh, and uh, this is very, very interesting because all uh, corporate uh, people, uh, volunteer, are very happy, but they are working in uh, to real ne uh, needs of association. So th this is the project that we were um, that we were developing with the help of Stavos Niarcos Foundation. In Portugal, there are no primary prevention on health care. So what we thought that is that at five years, we could make uh, um, an, uh, uh, the prevention from uh, to uh, eyes, uh, oral health and hearing. And so we found that for three, uh, fifty-three percent of the children uh, were had problems with audits, and f uh, twenty-four in vision. These uh, children, when they go to school in the first year of school, they are not getting good results, so they won't be good uh, students. And so that was what we launched with lots of uh, partners, and one of, of them was uh, Stavos Nearcos Foundation, and it was so great that uh, uh, I, I'm sure that public uh, who decides is going to uh, put these prevention checkups to all children. So I'm sure that together we can surely do even more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very struck by uh, some of the stuff we've heard, and uh, it reminds me of, of, of an anecdote uh, that I just heard very recently, a woman speaking to her child, saying, don't just do something, sit there. Sometimes you really do need to think uh, before you act. And uh, these are examples of where I think a, a great deal of thought has gone into how the pieces fit together. And frankly, the entire morning has been about uh, in an intelligent uh, use of what's already there and uh, mixing it up in a different way. Uh, we're open to questions, comments. We are late, so I'm going to try and uh, 
not prolong things unnecessarily, but if there are any questions or comments, we would be very happy to entertain them. My name is uh, Ingrid Schulero. I work for the Norwegian government. I'm sorry to prolong your session, but I do this because I'm leaving and I have some comments that I would like to share with you. Uh, excuse me for not being so relevant for the speakers. Actually, I visited Chicago recently and I saw a lot of very interesting civil society projects. But my comments uh, come from my general impressions. I've been um, responsible for the strategic planning of a Norwegian fund paid by the government um, covering 15 European states and I've also been uh, negotiating with the, the Greek government and responsible for Spain, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus, Malta and some others. Um, the program we have in Greece is approximately 60 million and we have uh, euros and we have decided to focus on the asylum sector, the environment, the civil society, and research. My comments are the following. And I'm a little bit struck because what I see is not only an economic crisis, I see a political crisis, I see a moral crisis and a deep sense of mistrust in the Greek society. And I've I spent the two days listening and, and I was thinking I cannot leave without sharing some views with you. I think the role of foundations during this economic political crisis could be uh, very challenging. And of course the social work and work with the social effect of the crisis is extremely important. But also to work on the trust, the lack of trust in the public sector in the private sector and being the bridge builder between those sectors must be a key challenge for all foundations in Greece, I think. At least that's my, that's my, my really um, clear assessment and also my, my key message. Um, based on the last OECD report, Greece is um, very low on efficiency, effectiveness, um, there is a huge amount of bureaucracy hampering the private sector, there is this deep lack of trust to the politicians and I believe all foundations can play a role here. You can increase accountability in your own foundations, you can foster platforms for dialogue between the private sector and the, and the government you, you are in a key position to, to create platforms for dialogue and to increase trust, be best practice, um, but, but you have to challenge the key systemic problems in your own country. I'm, I'm a little bit blunt, but it's really my advice to the foundations in Greece. Uh, we are working now of establishing a fund for civil society where we will focus a lot on these issues to support the NGOs that raises these issues, to promote a deep dialogue in, in Greece between the sectors, how to increase the trust in the system, increase accountability, uh, also to save you know, key democratic institutions in Greece. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ingrid. Uh, could you take the microphone? Uh, the lady with the hand up at the back there. I cannot uh, not answer to, to this uh, message you give. I'm uh, Rubini Terzaki again from Kid and Family. And thank you for talking about trust and communication and democracy. Uh, I will uh, use a little bit of your time addressing a question to Mr. Kaminis, the mayor of Athens, to give you just an example of what is going on. Uh, I know that the situation uh, we 
in which we live is difficult. And of course, it needs cooperation between uh, um, political governments, sorry, and I'm sorry for my English, and uh, municipality groups uh, of volunteers and foundations. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, our mayor of Athens, uh, the last two years we addressed to the municipality of Athens 17 requests for the same reason. We need a building for our unemployed families who cannot uh, have a solution uh, where to uh, keep uh, their children who uh, could and we could take care of them. The problem is a problem, first of all, of communication. We had no answer the last two years, not even a no. So uh, for, for me, it's the first time I have the opportunity to, to, to see our mayor, because he's, uh, of course, very much uh, uh, occupied, I think. I don't think he's uh, indifferent. But uh, th that is not a bureaucracy problem. It's a problem of communicating. And I am wondering how uh, the, the mayor of Athens expects to give an end of homeless, homelessness and giving help to unemployed families when, as a, gr as a group, we experienced that he haven't even answered to any of our 17 requests for the same reason. So um, I think uh, finally that uh, foundations maybe is our last hope, but also I think that uh, a better way of contacting each other is very important. We are not a group that we believe in political uh, uh, pressures or things like that. We believe in uh, uh, private and uh, volunteering work a lot. And we think that uh, proposals like uh, ours or of course of all, many other groups are very efficient now for our society. And I let you know that we already give help to 4,500 unemployed families with young children and we are only 486 volunteers. And the support we had from the foundation, it was a bureaucracy of 20 days. And that was it. So please, uh, Mr. Kaminis, could you answer? Because I can't find out why finally we can't reach you and we can't have any answer. Thank you. I'm not sure uh, I am authorized to say please answer, so I don't think I'm waiting to see if there are any more questions. Do you want to do that, sir? Please um, give the microphone. Yes, well. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, before being elected as mayor of Athens, I was the Greek ombudsman for eight years. And before that, for four years, I was deputy ombudsman. And it is true that one of my main problems was that public services did not answer to citizens who addressed claims or asked things. I know it's a big problem. And I also know and I have experienced that you cannot transform a huge bureaucratic entity as the municipality of Athens is from one day to another. That is the reason why uh, we have worked very hard to bring European funds to the municipality and the entity that is going to, to manage the whole thing is not the municipality itself, which is very difficult to reform, but a private, semi-private entity that we have created that is much more flexible and it will be more easy to respond to, to, to claims and to, to volunteers uh, as, as, as I suppose you are. 
Now, I cannot enter into the detail of why you didn't receive an answer because I'm not in the position eh, to know everything that happens or does not happen in the municipality. But I would be very pleased to meet you personally and address the whole thing and see what's going on. But in seven days, uh, I will give a public conference, a press conference, where I will expose the whole social program of the municipality for the next two years and how we are going to prepare ourselves for the period till 2020 and how we plan to bring uh, one and a half billion from European funds into the city. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. I am Stelios Vasilakis from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. This is a question from Jennifer. You spoke about the MacArthur Foundation investing approximately $40 million in the public school system in Chicago and basically saying that most of it was lost. And then you spoke about very high dropout rates in, in the public school system. Are you suggesting that because of the new technologies and the emergence of networks and the internet and everything else, that we're seeing such a radical shift in public education that we cannot deal with these problems the old ways? Do we have to start thinking about them a completely different way? Because this is a very significant amount of money that you spoke about, and you decided that that was gone and that you had to look in a completely different way to the problem. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think I was exaggerating a little bit when I said we threw $40 million out the window. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did move the, the, the needle a little bit, but we felt like we weren't really making a, enough of an impact. Um, and yes, in fact, we believe that the world has changed a lot in the last, especially 10 to 15 years. Um, and education really should adapt uh, to use the new tools that we have. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily so much the kids using the new tools in the classroom, but the ability of the tools to connect kids and uh, connect what kids are doing, uh, not only in the classroom, but outside of school. So, um, I guess I'm agreeing with your, your comment that, um, yes, we felt very much that it was time to reimagine what learning could look like and that digital tools could help us do that. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure whether I should uh, take this risk, but I'm going to. Um, do you want to just one sentence from each of you, and then I think we wrap it up um, from each person on the panel? Chris, do you want to start? Um, sure. Um, kind of building off um, Stelios's question and, and Jen's response, I think um, one important thing that MacArthur has, has shown in, in the U.S. that's really been deeply informative for those of us that have been in, in education is that to switch from an idea of education to one of learning. Um, and so that there is a flattening of systems um, going on with techno technological advancements in many industries and societies and cultures and that um, we can take that as a, a change agent within the world of learning and leverage it and actually use it as a vehicle for doing a lot of what people that were concerned about um, what the education system was and is um, and take that as a, as a pivot and a, as a momentum towards something new. So rather than one or two different technology tools, it's um, seeing what it's done in other industries and trying to be out in front of that and before it, education is radically changed in ways that we aren't comfortable with and instead um, empower it to really change the entire learning ecosystem that many of us have wanted for a long time. Okay. Jennifer? Um, yeah, well, and hopefully this goes without saying um, and that you sort of pulled this from my presentation, but Mark MacArthur, the Digital Media and Learning Program at MacArthur is really about funding innovation, sparking new ideas, inspiring people to think about learning in a different way, and creating a climate with which people can take the, the tools and the ideas and the principles that, through our grant making, have emerged to back to their communities, to mix 
are back to their schools or to their homes or to the soccer field or wherever, wherever it may be and remix those ideas and those principles in a way to begin to reimagine how we might do things differently. Um, and in part that has to do with the fact that schools really clearly can't do it on their own. They can't alone be responsible for educating kids. They, they haven't been able to do that so far. And that you really need to embrace all of the resources in a, in a community uh, to, to educate kids. And that's the best, we believe that's the best way to do it. Thanks. Uh, I would say working together. Uh, working together with several uh, actors, several um, parts of society, but working together is not working for, it's working with. And uh, what I have heard this morning with the homeless, this project is exactly uh, what I think it's, it can be done. We just can change society and uh, really create social value if we work together with people. Thank you. That's very good. And I really think that we've had uh, some evidence of the fact that we really need to deepen the discussion and we need to have a very robust discussion amongst ourselves. And I hope that as we proceed in the rest of today, we have more uh, frank conversation between ourselves about where we think uh, uh, lessons have been learned and what can be applied in different contexts. Thank you for your patience. I know we're running late. Thank you.